So in this part of the lecture, we will talk about measuring energy. And this device is called the calorimeter, is based upon counting particles. So the idea here is that when a particle enters a calorimeter, it produces secondary particles. A shower will develop, a cascade. And the secondary particles, in turn, at least the charged particles, they will be registered through a so-called scintillator, which you heard already about in the first lectures, and will be turned into light. So the ionization losses will be turned into light that you can detect with a device and with that uh, measurement of the light, you basically register a particle. Now, by counting particles, you basically can um, measure the energy, but how that how does it work? Now, let's talk about a very simple kind of cascade, that is a pure electromagnetic cascade. In that case, we have, for example, either an electron or a photon passing through the detector, and at sufficiently high energies, photon interaction will be dominated by pair production. At low energies, you have Compton scattering and you have also photoionization, but at sufficiently high energies, basically, we would uh, produce mostly only pairs, electron-positron pairs. And for the electrons and the positrons, you have two competing energy loss mechanisms. One would be ionization losses, and these dominate at low energies. At high energies, above a so-called critical energy, the energy will be mainly lost through Bremsstrahlung. So Bremsstrahlung is a process in which the electron is deflected by the Coulomb field of the nucleus, and because of, classically speaking, the acceleration, it starts radiating. In the treatment of quantum field theory, this is an emission of a single or multiple photons, given that it basically couples to the virtual photon of the nucleus. Both um, interactions that is pair production and Bremsstrahlung, share some common features. One of the things which we will simplify for now is that the energy of the incoming particle is shared between the outgoing particles. For the pair production, that's electron and positron, and for Bremsstrahlung, that's an electron and a photon. And in the most simple approach that we want to uh, use here to get an idea on, on uh, the mechanism, we just assume it's shared in an equal way. In detail, this is a bit more complicated, but this is, on average, not a bad estimate. <clears throat> so, um, the length scale over which uh, particles interact in the medium is characterized for the Bremsstrahlung by something we call the radiation length. So, the radiation length, x0 called, is proportional to 1 over charge uh, number z squared of the medium in which the electron propagates. And the radiation length characterizes the energy loss. So if you look at that equation here, you see that energy is lost over a, a distance, uh, which is the radiation length. For pair production, a photon will basically produce an electron-positron pair, again, in the field of the nucleus. I have sh uh, shown here the two Feynman diagrams for pair production and for uh, Bremsstrahlung process. And the distance over which a photon on average is being absorbed is relating to the um, Bremsstrahlung radiation length. Um, more accurately, it's 9 sevenths of a radiation length. So we can make a very simplifying assumption now. We say that basically after roughly one radiation length, the electrons will Bremsstrahl and the photon will pair produce. So in this way, we can make a very simple uh, schematic uh, a diagram which shows us how particles will behave after a number of radiation lengths. So we introduce this quantity t. t is defined as the ratio of path length over radiation length, so t counts the number of radiation lengths on the medium. And in the very simplified scheme that we say particles when they pair produce or do Bremsstrahlung, they basically produce secondary particles which will have each half of the incoming energy we can uh, end basically the particles will pair produce and do Bremsstrahlung after around radiation length. We can divide the, the medium into, um, in this case, four radiation lengths. So after the first radiation, radiation length, the incoming, in this case, electron with energy E0, um, goes into an electron and a photon, which each have E0 half. After two radiation lengths, then we will have E0 quarter, uh, 
shared by three electrons and one photon. And after the third, or uh, you know, after three radiation lengths, we will have an average energy of E08, and this will be shared by three photons and one, two, three, four, five electrons. Now, turning that into equations, we can basically state that the average energy after t radiation length is given by E0 times 2 to the minus t, and the number of particles after t radiation length will be on average 2 to the power of t. So the maximum of this process will, however, be reached once the energy or the average energy of the particles hit either first the pair production threshold or they hit the energy below which ionization losses start to dominate. It's usually the uh, critical energy which is hit first because that's larger than or most uh, media. This is uh, larger than the energy um, for pair production. So this critical energy is the one which, uh, which determines the position where the maximum is reached because once the average energy falls below this critical energy, the electrons will not do Bremsstrahlung anymore, but they will predominantly do ionization losses and they will be just lost. Keep in mind the electrons always do ionization losses, it's just that one energy loss channel dominates over the other. And so we define that the critical energy is given that uh, the energies that are lost between ionization is equal to the energy lost in Bremsstrahlung. And then we can basically take this first equation here, that is the energy, and we take the logarithm to the base of 2 if we want. And then basically we get a very simple equation which says that uh, the maximum energy, that is, we'd look at this equation when the maximum is reached, so E at T max. So um, the average energy will be then E critical, and on the right we have E0 times 2 to the minus T max, and then we take the logarithm. And then we'll have T max is given by um, the logarithm of 2 of E0 over Ec. So this will be depending upon the energy, but only logarithmically. And the number of particles in the maximum, we basically get when we put in the number of uh, the, the radiation lengths which have been passed until the maximum is reached. So this gives you 2 to the power of T max. And T max, as we saw now before, is logarithm 2 of E0 over Ec. So then the maximum number of particles scales directly with the energy of the incoming particle divided by something which is a, just a constant of the medium in which we're dealing with. So once we're able to count the number of particles, for example, the maximum, we basically measure the maximum energy. The maximum position itself depends also on the energy, so in principle also measuring the position of the maximum gives us a way of uh, estimating the energy, but it depends only logarithmically on the incoming energy. So uh, this is something which has to be taken into account, so that, for example, a calorimeter has to be sufficiently thick in terms of radiation lengths to still capture the maximum, and it has to go, let's say, roughly uh, 8 to, to 16 radiation lengths beyond the maximum to really capture, let's say, 98% of the energy or the particles uh, which travel through this calorimeter. So this is something which we have to take into account when we build a calorimeter. It always has some limitation when it comes to increasing energy, because at some point the Shaw maximum would basically lead to a leakage of the particles out of the calorimeter, and we will not be measuring all the energy anymore. We can look at this a little bit in more detail. There's various ways of parameterizing both the particle number as a function of uh, um, radiation lengths, as well as this uh, formula, which I just flashed here briefly, the so-called longer formula, which tells us how much energy is dissipated as a function of uh, shower uh, um, depth. And you see that, for example, here you see the energy deposited in, in, a, in a shower um, uh, as a function of the entrance. And there you see there's some slight differences between the different um, um, medium that you choose. And this is basically, basically captured by some parameters that you can use in the longer formula. Besides the longitudinal development of an air shower, you can also look at how broad the shower is transversely to the direction of the incoming particle. That's the so-called lateral shower development. And the most important quantity here for a pure electromagnetic shower is the so-called Molière radius. And the Molière radius um, is the radius in which the particles will be confined laterally. The Molière radius has to do with the multiple scattering, so electrons on the way through the medium will be scattered um, by passing close to a nucleus, 
and uh, see the Coulomb field of the nucleus. And this is a stochastic process. And the Molière radius basically gives us a measure of how broadly speaking the shower develops laterally. And it's given by um, its proportion to the radiation length x0. And it's also depending upon something which is called the ES. Um, this is the scattering energy, which is a, a natural constant. So this is medium independent, 21.2 MeV. And uh, the ratio of ES over EC, where EC is this, uh, already introduced critical energy, where I give a very simple parameterization, which is sort of uh, used for, for estimating the critical energy. And it depends upon um, uh, 1 over Z, so the charge number of the, of the medium. So it goes with 610 MeV roughly over Z. And so um, the Molière radius uh, is given up in this table. So you see this is now in, in distance in units of millimeters. And you see, for example, the Molière radius for, for lead is something like uh, 16, um, 1.6 centimeters. And for aluminum, it's something like uh, close to 5 centimeters. Now, the Molière radius is something, therefore, which if we want to design a calorimeter um, and we want to capture it, it, it makes sense to sort of make the size of each um, particle detection unit about the size of a Molière radius, because this is basically where we can measure then the, the shower particles, and they're confined in that in that radius. And it doesn't really make sense to make it much smaller than that, a single segment of a calorimeter, because we would, we would basically um, oversample the shower development, and that would be basically a waste of um, channels and of, of uh, detector complexity. Now, the simplest realization would be to produce a setup where we detect all the particles passing through in one way or the other, and we would count them and therefore determine the energy. In the more realistic case that you do not uh, want to build a detector which is fully sensitive, um, uh, that would be made up out of, a for example, a scintillating material, you would interleave layers of conversion material with a large charge number where the Bremsstrahlung process takes place. And this would make also the, the colorimeter more compact because typically the detection um, of light happens in, for example, organic scintillators. We'll come to them in a moment. And that means these are very um, lightweight, small charge charge number. And so this thing would become very, very big. So by putting lead layers, for example, in between, we um, separate the detection and the conversion and this is the so-called sampling calorimeter. And such a building block would have about the size of a Molière radius, and it would consist out of layers of scintillating materials and, for example, um, layers of lead, which would be sort of at the, at the size of about a radiation length, so uh, about half a centimeter of lead. And then we would measure the passage of the charged particles in the scintillator, the amount of light that we register in the scintillator is proportional to the number of particles, and therefore we would count the number of particles and reconstruct the energy. In order to catch also the, the part which would leak out of the sampling calorimeter, you would uh, complement the, the, the calorimeter with a um, tail catcher calorimeter, which consists out of larger blocks of conversion material and then uh, smaller numbers of layers of scintillating material. Now, um, just a note which I want to make here before we turn to the scintillator process a little bit. That is, this has all been discussed in the context of a pure electromagnetic cascade. In the case of a hadronic calorimeter, where you want to measure the energy of, for example, a proton which passes through, um, there would be a further uh, complexity involved because the uh, hadrons do not um, produce only electromagnetic particles, but they also produce, for example, mesons, and mesons will decay, they produce muons, they will also produce neutrinos, and so therefore some energy will basically pass through, and uh, we will not be able to register it. So a muon, for example, will just basically make uh, ionization losses, but it will be counted as one particle. So this would not be um, uh, in the spirit of measuring the energy by counting secondary particles in the cascade. And so another, another process is that hadronic or strongly interacting particles will also lead to excitation of the material, which would make the situation a bit more complicated. But however, the whole idea is still the same. You will still measure a number of particles and then find a way, for example, capturing the muons um, or um, calibrating carefully the, the losses which are going invisible. Now let's talk for a little while about the uh, way that the scintillator works. There was, of course, some mentioning of scintillators in the first part, but let me just briefly go through some of the things which are relevant for scintillators to make sure you understand what kind of materials are typically in use. 
and what differences there are. Now there's roughly speaking two types of scintillators. And there's so-called anorganic or crystal type scintillators and organic scintillators. So the main difference to capture it in, in essence is that the um, anorganic scintillators, they are usually um, made out of a material which, a large, which, which has a large charge number, is more solid, more massive. Whereas the organic ones are made out of um, molecules which are carbon-based and therefore they have a charge number of six. Let's talk briefly about the light production process in an anorganic scintillator. So a crystal lesson as an isolator consists out of a valence and a conduction band. And once um, a particle passes through and ionization losses are being deposited in a crystal, you have various ways of exciting the crystal. Essentially, you could, for example, excite phononics or um, some uh, acoustic waves. Um, and you could also excite either directly or through the uh, phonons um, electrons and you would lift them up from the valence band into the conduction band. In the conduction band, you would then have a freely moving electron and in the valence band, you would have a hole. Now, it's, they would ultimately recombine uh, at some point, but there's two different ways that the recombination can take place. One of them, the electron basically is getting trapped and it will recombine at its very later stage, so it takes a long time and it's not of relevance anymore. The other one is that uh, you could have the um, electron going back to the valence band through either a radiative or non-radiative process. The radiative process, as the name says, will produce a scintillation photon, and then this will be something that we can register. In the um, radiation less, this is something we call then quenching. Um, the energy would be lost in a sense that we do not see any visible light coming out. In a little bit more detail, if you look at the time sequence of this happening, um, again, down here you have the, um, uh, the, the valence band and also in addition to that, the core band, because the core band is essentially uh, the band of electrons um, which are very tightly bound to the nucleus. So you would basically um, have, for example, um, sufficient energy to, to excite an, an electron out of the core band up into the um, conduction band. And given that you deposit a lot of energy, we talk about several MeV, and the band gap is, let's say, 10, 10 electron volt or more. So the electron will have, um, on every, will have a distribution of energies, or the electrons will have a distribution of energies in the, in the conduction band, which is rather broad. And so there's actually some additional processes which bring down the energy of the, uh, of the, band, of the electrons. And these are happening fast because this is essentially a scattering which takes place on a very short time scale the level of 10 to the 4 minus 14, 10 to minus 15 seconds relating to the average uh, mean free path in the, in the conduction band. And so basically this will thermalize and produce in a broad distribution, but it will narrow, narrow down further and further and further. And at some point um, you will have then the um, electron and the hole forming uh, and they can recombine and produce scintillation photon. So this process takes of the order of nanosecond and longer. And that's important to keep in mind. So this process is intrinsically something which can take quite some time because of this, um, the way that the electrons thermalize in the system. And the organic scintillating material, on the other hand, we talk about um, excitation of, of individual molecules. So it's not that we basically have a solid state where we have a crystal lattice forming or we have the valence band and the uh, conduction band. But here we have individual molecules which are either in a fluid or they are in a polymer type uh, situation. And here you have um, through the, um, well, not to, I don't want to go too much into the chemistry of this, but essentially you have these, these pi states, the pi orbitals, which are perpendicular to the sigma orbitals when you form these kind of aromic rings. And th then what happens is that you, you basically excite um, a state in, in, this, in this band of, of, um, of pi, pi electrons, it's, it's, it's uh, then de-excited uh, within that band. And this happens very, very quickly until you basically uh, hit the bottom, the, 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 the lowest state of, of these kind of um, bands that are forming. So this takes place only picoseconds. And after that, you will have a fluorescence um, 
that is a radiative um, decay transition going to the to the um, to the base to the to the ground state, and that's the one that we want to use. There's also some possibility that it will go into a triplet state, uh, but that basically uh, takes takes even longer. So this would be a very delayed kind of emission, which comes then out in after milliseconds because these are forbidden uh, interactions or forbidden transitions. And some examples are given here. So um, P terphenyl, for example, C18814814 is a very common um, uh, molecule which is used as, as a scintillator material. And that is then usually dissolved in the form of a liquid scintillator or um, added to some uh, polymer uh, to form some plastic, which you can then form and you can use it in any kind of shape you want. Here's a big table which basically lists some of the main properties of the scintillating material. So as I said originally, the, the density is much smaller uh, than uh, for organic than for anorganic. For anorganic, there's for example sodium iodine, which has a doping of with tellurium to increase the efficiency, or cesium iodine with tellurium doping, also a similar way. Um, and these are the most common scintillator materials which are used. Sodium iodine has the disadvantage that it's very hygroscopic, so you have to shield it from water, otherwise it basically dissolves. And um, as cesium iodine um, is uh, together with sodium iodine really the most effective one. That is, you produce something like uh, 50,000 photons per MeV energy deposited, which is quite substantial. However, um, the time scale of these uh, transitions taking place is of the order of hundreds of nanoseconds. So this is rather slow. Um, this is different for the uh, de-excitation and plastic scintill scintillator material. We basically get a signal which is uh, roughly a few nanoseconds long. And here's some additional uh, crystal type uh, uh, samples which, which are used, um, which, uh, however, uh, you know, share some advantages, disadvantages, which relate to the material properties. It could be very brittle, very hygroscopic, and so on and so forth. Now, um, let's look at the performance of a calorimeter once more, because I discussed a little bit now what a calorimeter could be made of, so it's like a sandwich sampling type calorimeter. And, um, what is, however, the energy resolution that we can push these calorimeters? And again, I just did make the discussion mainly for the electromagnetic calorimeter. So the relative energy resolution, sigma E over E, depends upon a number of issues. Um, so let's talk about for a moment what a calorimeter does again. It counts number of particles. So on average, for example, you will have, I don't know, maybe 100 particles produced in such a secondary cascade. And you count them all, let's say with 100% efficiency then you would basically be left with a number which is on average 100, but it will fluctuate eventually. It could be larger, it could be smaller. The underlying statistics is essentially the Poissonian count statistics, and I give the uh, probability density function here. So for some expectation value mu, you would have a probability to count n particles, which is given by this exponential to the minus mu times mu to the power of n divided by n um, uh, facultate. This is something which is stochastic, you cannot avoid. So the only thing you can make, uh, you can improve this is by having more particles. But again, this is energy dependent. You cannot just uh, create new particles out of thin air. They have to be coming from the initial energy. So um, the number of particles that you will measure will fluctuate. And for the Poissonian statistics, the fluctuation or the variance of that number uh, is given by its expectation value. So the expectation value if you measure something is in the uh, simple interpretation, simply the number of particles you measure. So the variance of this number is then given by the number itself. So let's assume you have 100 particles which you um, detect, then you know that the variance of that number is 100. The square root of the variance gives you then how bro uh, a measure of the, uh, of, the, um, of, the, of the width of your distribution that you would measure is then 10. So you would measure roughly 100 particles plus minus 10. That would be a 10% energy resolution. If you go for 10,000 particles, then you would have uh, a variance of 10,000. Square root of that is 100. So that means that basically you would measure 1% um, uh, relative uncertainty of your energy. So you see the uncertainty in gets smaller, the relative uncertainty gets smaller and smaller and smaller, and does that with 1 over the square root of the energy. So, so this is then the first term which you usually have to consider because this is something which you cannot get around with, the count statistics term here. So that all goes with 1 over square root e. And I just introduce here a, a prefactor a because you have some efficiency losses and uh, you have to take some, some uh, conversion into account and so on and so forth. 
Now there's a second thing which happens, that is basically your number of particles that you measure will also fluctuate given that um, you, you have some, some particles which you lose, you have some particles which may not convert because of efficiency issues and so on and so forth. So you have some intrinsic uncertainty. And that is constant. So um, you, you will always measure some, um, some, some, some let's say, uh, you will always measure something like 10 particles uh, deviation. So it could be that on top of the uh, Poissonian fluctuation, you have always some additional uncertainty. And that is then this B term here. I call this the noise term. And that will be dominating at, at low energies because this goes with B over E because this is simply a constant um, sigma term which is energy independent and, and the relative uncertainty goes with B over E. So for small values of E, this will always be the dominating perform to, to term. And whereas then at higher and higher energies, um, you will be dominated by this count statistics term, there's another thing which happens, that is you will have some calibration issues, some generic uncertainties which come into the game uh, from your from your setup, and they, they are actually giving you a relative uncertainty which is constant. So let's say like a 1% uncertainty which you will always have. And this will eventually dominate at the highest energies because it's constant. So, so for typical values, let's say a very well-performing electromagnetic calorimeter, uh, you would basically see that the energy resolution, now this is plotted here as a function of energy, uh, goes down. So the lower part, it goes with 1 over E, then it goes with 1 over square root of E, and then it will flatten out to just be a constant value, let's say, if you, like a percent or a fraction of a percent, uh, given that C term. In the case of a hadronic calorimeter, because of the um, things which I mentioned before, this will be worse, so this will be always higher. And then there's a third way that you can measure energy, by measuring, for example, the momentum. And that is done through a tracker, where you measure the radius of curvature, and you will realize quickly then there that you basically um, the radius of curvature will be getting larger and larger and larger and so your relative uncertainty will get worse and worse and worse so that's why this green line basically if you do a momentum measurement you will at some point get worse than a calorimeter so in this case for example if you go beyond uh, 20 gv or so a momentum measurement will usually be worse than an electromagnetic calorimeter and this is just an, uh, a simple equation which gives you an idea how to measure or to calculate this curvature radius. So for a GeV particle, the curvature radius is 3 meters um, for a charge of 1 uh, electron unit and for a B field of 1 Tesla. So if you go now for 10 GeV or 20 GeV, your radius of curvature will be something like 60 meters. And then you can realize that it will be getting more and more complicated or difficult to measure that radius of curvature in a tracker which is not too big.